We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving the relationship between nations and to improve our understanding of our local indigenous peoples and their cultures. I would also like to recognize the Lytton area, Kakumshin and Enkaklap, where our efforts to safely return are centered. You are welcome to acknowledge the territory in which you are joining us from in the chat as well. I would like to acknowledge some of the local leaders joining us today from across the Lytton area. Thank you for being here. Councillor Harriet Isaac and the parliamentary secretaries, Jennifer Rice and Roly Russell. Before anything else, I want to wholeheartedly thank the residents and the organizations that continue to go over and above to support the community. So many of you are donating your time, services, and expertise to help others. We could not do this without you. Thank you for showing up for your neighbors day after day. As a continued thank you to our neighboring communities, businesses, relief organizations, agencies, government partners, and others, who continue to provide support and financial assistance. I would like to encourage everyone to look after your mental health right now. Between the wildfires, the evacuations, the floods, the washouts, and recently the snow, our community has been hard hit. If you're struggling, or need support, please connect with one of our free mental health services available to you. These are listed on our website. These setbacks are disheartening, but our recovery team is working extremely hard to continue making progress towards rebuilding LIP. Today, we have updates from our parliamentary secretaries, the Red Cross, Canada Post, and our recovery team but I wanted to highlight a few items that have been getting questions about. The Resiliency Center continues to operate in Lytton Monday to Friday between the hours of 10 and four at the Kumshin School. At the center, you can connect with other residents, access business support, social services, essential services and supplies. The Citizens Advisory Committee continues to meet on a bi-weekly basis, and the new Unmet Needs Committee will be established soon. Progress continues to be made on debris removal, the demolition process, and the critical infrastructure. James and Ron will speak to that a bit later. Last night at the Council meeting, the election procedures bylaw number 708 went through for the first three readings. It will be up for adoption at the next council meeting. More information on the by-election process will be provided to residents after the bylaw is adopted. We'll do our best to answer the questions you have today, though again, we still won't have the answers to some. Thank you again for being here with us tonight. I appreciate you for taking the time out of your day. Stay healthy, everyone. Now I'd like to introduce the provincial parliamentary secretaries, Jennifer Rice and Roly Russell to provide an update. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and thanks everybody for the opportunity to join you and to speak with you tonight. I'm Roly Russell. I'm the parliamentary secretary for rural development and I'm joined tonight by Jennifer Rice who is the Parliamentary Secretary for Emergency Preparedness. Uh, I'm happy to be joining you tonight from the traditional territory of the Insuction speaking people uh, here in Grand Forks. P.S. Rice and myself are both very grateful for the opportunity to join you again and to hear the updates from everybody tonight. As you know, we are continuing to work as recovery liaisons to support the community through what we know has been a very challenging uh, time and the ongoing task of rebuilding Lytton. As the mayor just mentioned, it's, uh, it's certainly been uh, remarkably difficult last few months and we're, we're very familiar with that. We had the privilege to visit Lytton a few weeks ago and it was great to be able to be there with boots on the ground and speak in person with some of the folks there that are leading your recovery. We also had some excellent round table conversation about how we can best help 
your community moving forward and through the rebuild. We heard and we saw more of what you actually need on the ground. And it's clear how important it is to get things moving faster. And we're helping get that done wherever, uh, wherever possible. We've been working to help move the village's recovery uh, forward and rebuild as quickly and safely as possible, working to support uh, what your local leaders identify as their needs. Last month, in order to help that process, the province provided $1 million grant to support Lytton's economic recovery, with 500,000 of that uh, going to support the community in your efforts to restart the local economy, and 500,000 for operational activities uh, within the village of Lytton. Ministry of Environment staff have also been working with the village on options to dispose of waste and debris, and the province's heritage branch staff have been helping local partners create a plan to advance that debris removal as quickly as possible. We know that debris removal has been uh, seen some significant setbacks and understand the challenges that this creates. And I see that the village will be providing an update later this evening on the progress being made there and the plans to get that process moving again as soon as possible. We're doing what we can to help the local leaders there address the challenges as they arise and speed up the recovery efforts in whatever way we can. And so I'll turn it over now to Jennifer to talk about some of the specific ways that we've been helping and some of the progress that we've been making. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roly. Uh, to begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the territory of the Coast Simshan people here in Prince Rupert. As Roly mentioned, we remain steadfast in our support for Lytton, and Lytton residents remain in our thoughts and those of British Columbians. The province follows a local model of emergency response and recovery. And we know that each community is different and you need to respond to the needs of your particular community. So we stand by to follow your lead and support you. This means that response and recovery are led locally with the provincial government working closely with local governments in a supportive way. We've continued to stay in close contact with your local leadership who have passed on their concerns and feedback from you. We're aware of the many challenges Lytton is facing in its recovery and rebuild. And that's why we're directly funding several positions on Lytton's recovery team to provide the community with the personnel needed to lead you through to next steps. This includes funding a project manager who is overseeing key work streams on debris removal and water systems, and they'll be providing updates later tonight. So I wanted to just um, share with you some of the positions that are funded by the province. So that includes the team Rubicon EOC staff, an EOC director, corporate financial analysts to do the finance uh, rebuild, on-site security, a housing specialist, uh, record retrieval, corporate officer, community recovery manager, environmental assessment contractors, legal staff, building and bylaw permitting consultant, a chief financial, financial officer, a CAO mentor, policy liaison consultant, an on-site local manager, a project manager, debris removal contractors, hazard and mitigation contractors, appliance removal contractors, an environmental engineer for municipal infrastructure works, and a re-entry plan coordinator. We um, we look, Roly and I, we look forward to hearing from you again tonight and taking your feedback to Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth and our provincial partners. Recovery can be a long road, but we know that we'll be here for you as we walk down that road together and build back even stronger. So thank you for including uh, Parliamentary Secretary Roly Russell and I um, tonight in your town hall. Thank you. Thank you so much, Parliamentary Secretaries Rice and Russell. So good to hear from you. So hi everyone, if you if we haven't already met in the past, my name is Jasmine Patrick and I'll be helping moderate the community meeting today. Um, so as the monitor, moderator for the evening, my role is to manage the flow of the meeting and just make sure that we're, we're staying on track in terms of time. So we're just gonna share the presentation here. Um, and I just wanna give you a quick glance at the agenda on the next slide here so that you know what to expect over the next two hours. So in a second, as I did last time, I'm just gonna run through some quick housekeeping items and Zoom tools. Then we're gonna have a presentation from the Red Cross and they'll provide an update followed specifically by a Q&A for the Red Cross. 
Uh, our recovery manager will then provide an update on the short-term recovery, recovery plan initiatives, and you can see all the topics underneath there. We'll go through each and every one. After the updates, we're going to open up the session to all questions. Uh, so we're doing it a little bit differently than the last time. So instead of having questions after each topic, we'll be doing them all together at the end of the update session. Um, so please raise your hand on Zoom if you'd like to ask a question or just post it in the chat, whatever you prefer. As usual, uh, we're also encouraging you to share some good news stories today and messages of thanks for other uh, organizations or residents that have been going over and above to make a difference. We'd love to hear those thoughts and ideas um, and the messages of thanks. So finally, at the very end, we're gonna close off with, just, with some final remarks uh, and the date of the next meeting. I also just wanna mention that if you haven't already seen them, the unanswered questions from the November 8th and the December 9th community meeting are posted to the website along with recordings. So we'll put those uh, links in the chat for you in just a second. So the purpose of today's session is to provide an opportunity for residents to ask questions and give feedback provide you with the latest updates on short-term recovery plan initiatives, and then discuss Red Cross services in more detail through their presentation. There are a few rules for participation. So number one, you should be aware that the meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on the Village of Lytton website. We ask that you please be respectful in your tone and with the use of the chat box and of keeping um, time by making your questions direct and to the point and allowing others to speak. Please use appropriate language, refrain from using any profanities or abusive language. Negative comments toward any individuals will not be tolerated tonight. So anyone using abusive language will be removed from the session. If any media are in the room, you're very welcome to be here. However, the primary purpose of this meeting is to answer residents' questions. So we ask um, that you please be respectful and hold off your questions and email them to communication at litton.ca and we'll respond to those after the meeting. Uh, we won't have enough time for all the questions um, tonight, probably. Uh, we will be done at about nine o'clock tonight. However, we'll make sure that we mark them down and they'll be answered in writing as soon as possible with the responses posted online. And then finally, please speak up. We're here today uh, again to get your thoughts and questions and feedback. So please uh, share all of your ideas. I just want to take a couple minutes now to explain how to use the Zoom platform, just in case anybody has never used it before. Um, so first, at the bottom of your screen, as you'll see on the presentation here, um, you're going to see a chat button. So if you click the chat button, box is going to pop up on the right hand side of your screen, and you can use the chat function to send your questions today. At the end of the meeting, uh, there's gonna be the opportunity for you to ask your questions out loud. So like I mentioned before, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. And you can find that by clicking reactions on the bottom of your screen uh, and then clicking raise hand. When it's your turn, I'll read your name and we'll ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, you're gonna get a pop-up on your screen asking you to unmute. So you just have to click that. And if you're joining us by landline telephone today, you can still participate. Uh, it's just a little bit different. So you hit star six for toggle um, to mute and unmute, star six. And then star nine is to raise your hand. So we'll, oh, they're already in the chat there, just as a reminder. And finally, if at any point in the session you run into any technical issues and need help, please email communication at linton.ca and we'll do our best to help guide you through that. So, that's the end of my opening remarks here. I'm going to pass it on over to Jody and Emily from the Red Cross for their presentation. Thanks so much, Jasmine. My name is Jody Boyle, um, and I'm the uh, oops, there you go. Um, I'm the senior manager for recovery programs for BC and Yukon for the Canadian Red Cross. Uh, you might remember me from last time. I had the pleasure of presenting. Uh, thank you so much for including us tonight. Uh, we always jump at opportunities to speak um, about our programming and make sure it's clear for everybody. I wanted to acknowledge I'm joining you today from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people here in Vancouver Island, Southern Vancouver Island. Um, and I wanted to take a minute also to introduce our recovery manager. Um, so 
Tammy Germain is joined us on the line. So some of you may re remember Tammy from uh, throughout December. She was able to spend some time um, in the Resiliency Center and she was um, in and around Lytton. Um, Tammy's not speaking tonight. I just wanted to make sure people could put a face to a name. We've been asked to go into a little bit more detail around case management um, and exactly what uh, recovery support services are in a little bit more detail just to demystify the process for people. Um, so I've invited my colleague, uh, Emily Pietropalo to um, go into a little bit more depth on that. So it's my pleasure to introduce um, our Senior Director for Recovery Services with our National Office, um, Emily Pietropalo. Uh, over to you, Emily. Thanks, Jody. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Emily. Uh, I'm joining you tonight uh, from Toronto, so it's a little bit later for me, um, but I want to acknowledge that it's the uh, traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and so thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, and so um, we wanted to provide a little bit more information on what the Red Cross is um, doing and how you can access our services and what supports are available to you. Um, before I launch in, just Sorry, Jasmine, are you projecting the um, PowerPoint or should I be doing that? Yeah, you can feel free to share the screen or if you want to email it over, I can share it on my end, but feel free to do that. Okay, I'll send it to you. Um, Just one second here. Emily, I have it up if that's helpful. I can show um, Jasmine if you can make me a co-host. Yeah, sure. My Our system's being a little bit slow today. Uh, you should have permissions now, Jody. Okay, thanks, Jody. Sorry, our, our Red Cross system is very slow today. Um, so, um, Tammy, uh, I know who didn't speak tonight, um, oh, uh, was in uh, Lytton in December. This is one of her photos, which we thought was quite beautiful, just to share. Um, next slide over, Jody. Um, we went through this on the last um, town hall, so we won't spend too much time, but just so that you know who we are. Um, I won't, I, I'm not a big fan of reading off of slides, um, so I'll just kind of ad lib a little bit here, but um, this is the mission of the Red Cross and um, we're happy to be uh, supporting the community as much as we can. Next slide, Jody. Um, some of the things that are important to know about us is that we're part of a really large international movement. Um, there's over 190 Red Cross, Red Cross and societies around the world. We're a registered charity in Canada and we're independent of the government, although we do work very closely with government partners, um, of course, um, such as right now for the fires. And um, our approach is always around, um, you know, it's a, we're a humanitarian based organization. It's how we support people. So um, the strength of our work really sits with um, our workforce, um, the people that um, we're lucky to call, call staff and volunteers working with um, you, the impacted persons. Um, go to the next one, Jody, because you spoke to this last time. So um, I think that most people are probably have seen some of this language um, in the last you know, few months. And so we'll just go into a little bit more detail of what 
what this means and how uh, you can access them and what you're sort of what you should expect when you engage with the Red Cross. So um, we have three kind of different service offerings. They do overlap a little bit. Um, and so the first one is individualized recovery supports. Um, sometimes it's been referred to as case management. That's the other thing we call it sometimes. Um, and what it is really about having a case manager sit down with you as the, the person who's been impacted and talking through what your needs are, what your impacts have been, and how we can support you on your road to recovery. Um, through that support, we also are offering interim housing um, assistance and food supports um, for many of you who, you know, obviously have not been able to return home yet. And so again, that's always through your case manager. Your case manager is your really like your point of contact for um, how to access all Red Cross services. And then housing repair and reconstruction supports um, as well, again, through your case manager. So looking at, um, you know, what, uh, you know, if you did have insurance, what your insurance may cover, looking at gaps, that kind of thing, um, and helping people to fill those gaps so they can actually return home. Next slide, Jody. Um, so how you access or support. So there's a couple ways, and this is, um, so this is for someone who maybe has never accessed Red Cross supports. So you can call our call center. That's the 1-800 number there. Um, you can also email us. And the next step is to book an appointment. Um, it's important to note that the call center number are call center agents, um, and they're very knowledgeable about Red Cross services, but they are not case managers. So by calling the 1-800 number, you're not going to speak speaking to a case manager right away. You're gonna to talk to a call center agent who's gonna take down some information from you and then send your information over to our case management team. And someone from that case management team will give you a call back and set up a time for an appointment that works best for you. Um, if you email us uh, on the other end of the email uh, is our case management team. And so the same process happens whereby they still need to connect you with the case manager and then book you an appointment. Um, the appointments are roughly about an hour in length usually uh, to start and, um, you know, we, we begin by just sort of, I, I think our role really is to listen. Um, and so our role is to let you know what we can, how we can support you, but it's also um, listening and trying to understand how, what you've been, how you've been impacted and how we might be able to support you. And our job as case managers um, is to try and connect um, what those needs are that we're hearing with what resources we may have, including services, as well as referrals to other agencies. So the next slide, Jody. Um, so some of the things uh, that you'll probably experience with your case manager is that once you're assigned to a case manager, um, typically you're with that case manager for the length of your recovery. Um, you know, you can always ask for a different case manager if you're not feeling connected to that person. Um, if that person goes on vacation, rest assured we have someone who will step in and support while that person's away. Um, the goal is to work at your pace. Recovery, you know, is, is a long road and everyone moves through it differently. Everyone's ready to take different steps differently. And so the goal is to understand where you're at and how we can help you move forward. That could be really big steps, that could be smaller steps, whatever it, whatever it looks like for you, our job is to meet you where you are and, and move you forward as much as possible. Um, we work with lots of other agencies to provide referrals. Um, it's also looking at, you know, we have internal expertise. So, um, you know, for looking at things like insurance documents, if you have questions about insurance, and then, um, you know, we have insurance experts on our staff who can take a look at insurance policies, for example, if you have questions about the rebuilding process, I understand, you know, it's very complex in Lytton, but we do have people um, who can support with questions like that. So it's about also how your case manager can help you access other supports. Um, at the end of the day, your recovery is your recovery. It's not, it's not for us to lead, it's for you to lead and for us to support you along the way and sit alongside you. Next slide, Judy. Um, and so this is really what you'll kind of experience when you're sitting with a case manager. And this isn't a, a one, two, three kind of thing, but this is generally the flow of what will happen. And once you start working with a case manager, you'll start to get into this kind of, it'll be a cycle of um, typically their monthly appointments. And so you'll meet every month. 
um, you know, you'll provide, you know, updates of where you're at and, you know, other questions that you may have or other barriers you're facing. And then the case manager will work with you to continue to provide you that support and assistance um, and move forward with you. So it can look like providing you, again, referrals. It can look like just sort of helping you figure out the next step where you need to go um, or what to do next. It can be also providing financial assistance around like the interim housing supports, for example, or food supports. Um, and then it's really about if you would like to sort of build a, a what we call a recovery plan, it's also helping you figure out what that recovery plan looks like for you and, um, you know, how it may change from month to month or, you know, every few months and how you can keep adjusting it to keep moving forward to your, for your goals for recovery. Um, and then at the end of each appointment, uh, typically we book another um we book another appointment with you and then we kind of, you know, every month we're, we're interacting with you. You can always reach your case manager in between appointments as well. If you need to, if you want an appointment in between or if you want to just reach out, um, once you're connected with them, you should be able to reach them um, via email or phone uh, when you need to. I think that's uh, the last slide, Jody, you can flip forward. So that's it. Um, Great. If anybody has questions for the Red Cross, um, please put those in the chat now or feel free to raise your hand. I see a few questions that have come in um, for General Village of Lytton staff, um, but if you have any specifically for the Red Cross, please send those now. a couple more seconds just in case somebody is furiously typing them out. Uh, what food supports are being provided? Um, the food supports that are being provided um, are very similar to what was provided under ESS and so um, you would I, I, it depends on the eligibility for the programming, but I think it's 2250 a day um, per person. So that's what the food supports are right now. Great, thanks Emily. Uh, the next question is, what is the expected turnaround time to get a case manager? Um, and then there's a comment that just says, I understand that some folks are waiting for a call back. Uh, it shouldn't be very long and we have a, a big team of case managers. Um, I think that, we have uh, seen a couple of delays um, with just some, you know, people out sick, unfortunately, due to COVID. Um, but if there's anyone who's waiting, you know, they can always send the email. If they haven't heard back, feel free to send another email and reach out um, or call the call center and they can flag it to us. Um, but it shouldn't, I, I don't think it should take longer than a week. But if it's taking longer than that, like, please let us know so we can also look at if we need to increase our capacity. Uh, we just have another question. Um, how do we get another case manager? If you um, want a different case manager, um, you just need to, you can email and sort of, if, you, if you're not comfortable sharing that with them, um, you can email and just say that you'd like to speak to a supervisor and then the supervisor can call you back um, confidentially and you can have that conversation with them and they'll assign you to a different case manager. If you're comfortable letting your case manager know that it's just not a right, the right fit, then they will take that to their supervisor and the supervisor will um, adjust and find a different case manager for you. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next one is, is there a process to vet concerns or complaints through? Um, for example, a need identified but support being denied. Um, right now, it'd be, it's the same email address, but what I would say is um, we, you can flag it as a complaint um, and then it'll go directly up to um, not just the supervisor, but our case management uh, leadership team. And they will take a look and see, um, you know, look at the case file, look at what happened, um, give you a call to understand um, your side of, of what you, you know, what you experienced, and then try to find a solution, um, as, depending on what the situation is. Perfect. That's helpful. Um, any final questions for the Red Cross? Just give it a couple more seconds here. Oh, here we go. 
Uh, are there any Red Cross supports for community members who are still in the Lytton area and lost their community but did not lose their homes in the fire? The case manager who I spoke to said there were none available. Um, there, I mean, so the supports um, that are available to people who didn't lose their homes but are still were still impacted, you can still access that. Um, if you go back to that slide, that first bullet around individualized um, support. So what that means is. Um, it's really about the navigation. So if you just want to sit with someone and talk to someone, um, figure out your next steps, we can help you look at um, if, you know, any, if you had any damage to your property and you're looking at, you know, an insurance form or something, we can help you with that. Um, it's about, we can still connect you to referrals. We can make sure you have access to mental health supports. Um, so there's still other supports available. They just look a little bit different than um, people whose homes uh, were unfortunately lost. Perfect. Um, is there a different process for Indigenous folks in the area who were living in the village of Lytton? Uh, there isn't a different process per se, um, but we do uh, have case managers who are experienced working with Indigenous peoples or who have lived experience um, as Indigenous persons. And so we try to make sure that you're connecting with those people as much as possible, um, depending on um, you know, understanding, you know, Lytton First Nation and sort of um, community members broadly who lived in the village and not in the village, um, we would look at your individual case file and make sure that, you know, um, you're either connected with the Red Cross or you're connected with the village or with Lytton First Nation. Um, and it's always up to you who you want to work with. So if you'd like to work with Lytton First Nation as your primary um, kind of uh, case management team, then by all means, um, that's entirely up to you. And we we're trying to establish a way of working uh, with them on the case management side so that um, we're, we're aligned to uh, supporting you as an individual. Great. And, and just two final questions here. So the first is, is the Red Cross providing building and food support or is the billeting funding including both? Say that again, Jasmine, sorry. Uh, is the Red Cross providing billeting and food support or is the billeting funding including both? Um, I believe that they're they're slightly separate, um, but I don't know the exact, you know, like the exact amounts or anything. They, they should be two different things. So um, typically the billeting would fall under that like interim housing piece and then food supports is a separate piece. Great. And then just the last question that we have time for is, will the Red Cross be providing rapid antigen tests in the community? No, um, we don't provide rapid antigen tests um, to broad community right now. Um, we do have a program. I don't want to go too far down another rabbit hole, but we do have a program where we're helping community organizations access rapid tests for their personnel. Um, but we are not distributing rapid tests um, broadly right now. Okay. Uh, and that could be a question for interior health. So we can bring that up here as well. Um, and I think those are all the questions I'm seeing. Um, if you do have any more questions for the Red Cross, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll make sure that they uh, get them afterward and we'll provide those responses. Um, but thank you so, so much, Emily, for being here and for, for the presentation. Thank you for having us. So next on the list are some recovery manager updates from Allison. So I'll turn it on over to her. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to see so many folks in the uh, meeting this evening. And I'm happy to provide uh, updates uh, from my team and what we are doing in uh, the recovery and the implementation of the short-term uh, recovery plan. Uh, what I've, I'll just uh, start with a few introductory remarks before uh, putting it, uh, putting the uh, spotlight on James, hi, and our project team. Um, oh, I forgot. Um, we have um, a representative here from MOTI, the uh, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. Um, I'm not sure if they would like to um, go first uh, and share their update. Certainly can, Allison, if that, that works for you. Yeah, you bet. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, great. So hello, to all. I was, uh, if you don't recall, I attended your last meeting. So I'm Steve Surratt. I'm the executive director for the Southern Interior Region. 
Uh, and it was um, in part leading with my colleague here, who's also joining me tonight, Brian Taylor, the corridor director for the Highway 1 Canyon uh, Recovery Pro Response Projects. So I'll provide a bit of an update on just where we're at holistically, and then I'll turn it over to Brian and he'll provide just a bit of what the traffic management plan is going to look like and some ongoing work that's uh, still going to be occurring out there once we open. Uh, so starting with the, um, you know, break it up into two sections. So from Linton uh, uh, North, um, we've actually, as of today, had a soft opening. So we were able to repair the sites at Gladwin, uh, Tank Hill, uh, finished paving yesterday. Uh, the accurate rail crossing is in, the signals are in. Uh, we're still working on some of the preemption work for our highway and some uh, other safety measures for when traffic uh, just to allow traffic to flow without traffic control people. Uh, but that, uh, that's not ready to accept traffic. And then lastly, the Nickerman uh, Highway Bridge, the detour bridge is now installed. Um, the crews through there, I think, as you guys know, <coughs> what the weather has been like through there, uh, it's been working through just horrendous conditions with the, through the cold temperatures and, and full on to try and get that open. And so as of uh, tomorrow morning, we'll be, um, we'll be fully open from that section from Lytton to Spence's Bridge, which is awesome news and a huge credit to the, um, the crews that have been working out there uh, night and day. Uh, the section Lytton, Lytton, Lytton South, so Lytton to Hope and our Jackass site, unfortunately hasn't been quite as favorable. Uh, I think we're on about 11 days now that we haven't been able to access the site by our crews because of the avalanche risk out there. Uh, I, I actually drove the corridor on, uh, I believe it was Monday, and the amount of snow is astonishing that's out there. I'm sure all of you locals are fully aware, but um, we're, in, uh, we're into not unprecedented, but I think it's been since the 70s that our avalanche crews are saying that we've seen conditions even remotely like this. Uh, and that slowed down the efforts of getting the, the jackass site open. We have launched the Acro Bridge and it is in place. We just need to be able to get in there and get the deck panels on and finish the the um, the road the road um, approaches to the bridge and get that open. So there's about a week left of work. Just right now, the weather is really hampering us. So. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to meet that target in mid January. We're now saying the end of January. Uh, that's very much weather dependent. If the weather cooperates from here on out, it sounds like tomorrow we'll be able to gain access to that site. So if the way if the weather cooperates from here on out, then I'm confident that we'll be open before the end of January. Um, but <laughs> it doesn't seem like weather's been our friend for uh, most of the, the last year now. So, um, but crews will work 24 seven once they can get in there to get that section of, and, and the full corridor open as quickly as possible. We certainly appreciate the, um, the challenges presented to the recovery efforts for Lytton as well. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Brian just to provide a little bit of update on what to expect from a traffic management standpoint and additional work. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, I echo Steve's comments there. It's been, it's been a challenge to get to this far, but we are the home stretch for, at least from the Lytton or Kanakabar area to the north. Um, it, it will be a very different corridor once it does uh, the travel pub will see it again we have a single lane section at the nickerman site so the highway bridge did sustain quite a bit of damage um it was on when the footings was undermined it actually displaced the bridge somewhat so the detour bridge has been installed so the traffic there you'll see a single lane and that's controlled by 24-hour flagging uh due to this the constraints of the site the, um, the highway is now kind of restricted to um, loads a length of 25 meters or less, just given the geometry. Um, so I know that's uh, working with the Linton as far as recover efforts to see what kind of so, so loads have been coming through there. So it will really work with you guys. If you have any information, we can go through our engineering process to make sure we can try and get the loads through for the recovery efforts. Uh, Tank Hill, again, like Steve said, we have a level crossing there now, which uh, we haven't had before, and it'll be a bit of a different system that's a bit unique this way because we have a electronic preemption system in place. Once it gets up and running, it's just working on the final stages now. It should be the next week or so. Uh, it will be controlled by 24-hour flagging in the meantime. But once the electronics are in, you'll actually have traffic lights on the highway, just uh, about three or four meters east of the rail crossing on the Nickman side. And then on the Layton side, about a kilometer up the road, you'll have a set of traffic lights and it'll actually control when the train comes, it'll trigger the system to activate, the gates will come down, 
the lights go red. So it'll be uh, an interesting to be an adjustment for some people to uh, get used to that spot. So the rest of the sites further south, the Gladwin site is two lanes. It's open now. Again, it's been a bit of a, a challenge to get it open. Again, the tough weather conditions, but uh, we're glad we got this far. When the Jackass site does open up again, that'll be a different spot for people. The uh, single lane acro bridge is being be installed so when it does get opened. It'll be a pilot car system through there because due to the avalanche zones and the risk of that, uh, you can't have vehicles stopped in certain areas. So between that and the single lane bridge, it's about a four kilometer section where it will be piloted through there. And that'll be 24 seven pilot car service um, until the recovery, the long-term fixes are in place at that site. New to myself. Um, also, I know last time there was some interest in Highway 8 and the, re the repair work there. So Highway 8 um, crews are continuing to work um, seven days a week out there to try and regain access. Uh, they've they've repaired the, um, the first bridge at the Spences Bridge and um, uh, Kurnow Bridge, and they're now working on Rattlesnake and are kind of progressively moved forward and forward to get <clears throat> to gain access. Uh, and then um, concurrently doing it at the Meriden as well and trying to move in. Uh, they're now into the trickier parts, like that is still something that's going to take months before access is fully restored through there. And it's the goal is to get a single lane uh, construction access through there first, followed by two lane, then followed by the long term recovery. But even just the construction access and just getting residents back home is it's a it's a process of months for that one, just because of the, the catastrophic damage that that one's received. Uh, so lots of work left to go there. Um, with that, Brian touched on the traffic management piece, so happy to take any questions that people have. I think I saw a few in the chat. There's a couple here. So the first is, will there be an opening time tomorrow for folks to go <clears throat> north? Uh, for all intents and purposes, you can go now. Today we were allowing traffic through. It was actually quite busy. We were allowing a few uh, larger loads through as well. So um for locals if you show up you'll get through we just haven't announced an actual opening so tomorrow morning we'll put it out on drive bc and an information bulletin will go out but um if you're if, if you live in the area and you want to travel through you will be able to get through great the next question is what time can we leave for cam loops um so similar and what issue may cause a two-hour wait uh can you give it a possible example of that yeah, so you might be so in our newsletter this week we referred to how long it may, how much how much extra time it might take to drive the entire corridor from Hope to Spence's Bridge, uh, and that really is that that I will say is what we're you know it's our worst case scenario, and and we'll do some real time modeling once we actually do open fully and and update that time as we see how long it actually takes. But it's largely going to depend on the amount of volume that shows up here. We're not going to be restricting the type of traffic, type of vehicles that can use it. We're certainly going to be advertising for larger trucks to um, use the Coquihalla and only, you know, this area be for local local trucks. Uh, but we're not going to actually restrict it the way we have with other traffic. So depending on the volumes, Brian mentioned the four kilometer pilot. There's going to be long queues there. It's going to take a little bit of time to get through that section. There's the, the accurate rail crossing that tank. That's going to add some additional time. Uh, to your journey. And then there's also the single lane section through Nickelman. Uh, that's going to add some additional time there. So that's why we're saying it's up to, up to two hours, but not guaranteed. I think it's going to vary for each individual person, uh, the time of day, how much volumes on the corridor um, and the weather. Um, what I will say too, is for Nickelman, uh, the, the single lane through there is, is going to be temporary. I think we're, we are working on repairing the highway bridge uh, as we speak. And we're, we're hoping that's going to be a, you know, an end of February, early, early March timeframe, if all goes well again with the weather, that we can have the highway bridge and that will be a two lane section and remove that single lane, which will then decrease the amount of time it might take you to get through the corridor. At that point, it will just be the single lane at Jackass and the Accra Rail Crossing. And those are both going to be in place for uh, a number of months, if not longer, because those repairs are quite significant. Right. Perfect. Thanks. And then the last question for you is, um, has the pilot car job posting been filled? Uh, we had a SWAR maintenance contractor, YRB in this area, and Emil Anderson for the Jackass site. They are coordinating the traffic control. They have um, 
they have secured traffic control companies in order to do that. But I, what I would say is um, if there's an interest or if there's people, I, it's going to be there for a long time and 24 seven. So resources are always a challenge. I would say reach out to our maintenance contractor, YRB, who are they're, they're local there in Lytton. They have their building outside. I would connect with them and they can connect you with the companies they've got, um, they've got out there. Great. Thanks so much. And I think that was the last question. So just thank you so much to you and Brian for, for the update today. You this, uh, if I can just want to add one thing I just about around the work there, Steve had touched on the sure. existing bridges being rehab, but I guess just a message it still is there still is active construction at a number of the sites along the way. I just forgot to mention that. So again, the electrical electrical work being done at the Tank Hill still, the Gladwin siding and the is working on spots they are off highway, so the, the road is open, but just to be aware, they are still active construction sites, and that's kind of what we want to message as well. It's very different. There's a lot of new signs or people traveling through there. So it will look a lot different um, for the next, say, yeah, a couple months. So, Perfect. Thank you for that. Thank you both so, so much. And I'll turn it back over to Allison here. Great. And thank you so much, uh, Moti, uh, Representative Steve and Brian. We, I, I know that a few folks were waiting for those updates. So we really appreciate that. Um, so, um, I, I, again, I just wanted to sort of begin by chatting about one of the major questions that I have been getting um, both privately and have been seeing on not only, you know, uh, the village of Lytton social media sites and, and other um, groups that are associated with Lytton. And that question is, what's the heck is taking so long? And I know that so many people have that question and so many people are, you know, really waiting for the, the processes to get underway and get started. Um, we do have a number of work plans that are in place and James will speak to the ones associated with debris removal and critical infrastructure. Our primary goal is to be sure that when we open up Lytton for rebuilding, it's a site that's free of contaminants. It's a site where it is safe to rebuild and it is a site that is safe to live in really. Um, because the, the village of Lytton is um, a member of the BC Community Charter and um, uh, parliamentary secretaries Rice and Russell alluded to some of the legislation that we are bound by uh, legally, we have to comply with this legislation. That includes the Heritage Conservation Act that was originally put in in 1996. Uh, the Environmental Management Act that um, outlines how we have to do soil remediation to make sure that the soils and things are safe for rebuild. And um, of course, the Emergency Programs Act that outlines how we progress through the state of local emergency. So with that, you know, uh, we are bound by the, that legislation. Now, complicating factors, um, of course, was the atmospheric river um, that happened on November 14th and 15th. And associated with that, we had a number, obviously, the access issues that you know, are, are now being somewhat resolved, um, but we have load limits. So there are restrictions on the amount of debris we can physically take out of Lytton at this time. So we're, we're constrained in a number of ways, both by the winter conditions, the, the heavy snowfall, the access issues, the load limits, and of course, the fact that we have to comply with the legislation. So uh, with that, I will hand it over uh, to James, and uh, he can provide a further uh, overview of both the debris removal uh, process and the critical infrastructure um, uh, project plan that we are putting together. Over to you, James. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for your time tonight. Uh, some of you have met me, others haven't. My name is James High. I've been uh, 
hired by the village of Lytton to act as the project manager for many aspects of the recovery. Um, I would say starting primarily with the, the debris uh, or remediation project and also the, the critical infrastructure. And then I'm sure that those projects will continue um, for the foreseeable future. So I just wanted to give a bit of an update. Um, Allison summarized it pretty well. I think the MOTI guys also did. Um, there's certainly been some hindrance in getting the project moving. I think everybody in Lytton recognizes that. Uh, I do think there was an opportunity for some of the de debris removal, some of the surface ash and, and debris to get started. And I know that there was a plan actively in place uh, by a number of people um, led uh, primarily by the insurers and the insurance companies and their, their consultants and contractors. Uh, I think that got the window got missed uh, trying to get that out from the atmospheric river. Um, so I, I do think there could have been some activity done, uh, you know, right at the end of the season that that unfortunately didn't get moved. Uh, that said, uh, Allison did also indicate, you know, the the heritage aspect. So even if the ash had got removed on a portion of the town site, I think we still would have installed uh, until we can get some of the permitting in place to actually start uh, accessing the ground level. Um, items like the the basements and the block work and, and some of the infrastructure in the community. So what we're trying to do now, I think, um, and I think everybody here gets it, it's a pretty big coordinated effort. There's a lot of agencies, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of um, stuff going on. And I think a lot of people are doing things somewhat in silos in some cases or working together without understanding what others are doing to support it. So I think my the first thing I've been doing it's just really collecting that data, talking to people about what's going on, what's been done, um, what's the plans, talking strategy, talking tactics, really gathering information. Uh, I'm trying to bring all that information into a project plan, something that really describes the project, um, starts to put details around the project, starts to put timelines around the project, uh, starts to identify gaps in the plan uh, and put working groups together to address those gaps and bring recommendations forward to the project team. Um, really a governance structure around the project so that we are talking um, in a coordinated approach. So some of the things that we're looking at right now is the permitting from the Heritage Branch. Uh, they've had a working group together for quite a while addressing this. Uh, I think we're really close from what I understand towards the end of January or February to have a permit that can be recommended forward for the village. Um, and so, you know, hopefully by the end of February or into March, we would have a permit for that heritage aspect for all the in-ground work, um, which is a really big milestone achievement, I think, and a lot of works went into achieving that. Um, winter conditions certainly got in the way. I, I don't suspect uh, the insurers are going to be moving to move any of the surface debris while there's accumulation of snow on the ground. Um, simply just the, the logistics of trying to move wet or heavy snow and ice. Um, it is, is prohibitive, generally speaking, uh, and there's a lot of inefficiencies in doing work in that kind of environment. Um, but once we do get in the ground and start moving that, that debris off and the permits are in place, the next step, I think a lot of you know, would be to, to get in the ground, um, move the, the more contaminated materials, redo the testing, as Allison indicated, make sure the site is safe and secure. While we're in the ground, we want to do the critical infrastructure improvements. Uh, so at the same time, while we're looking at the debris removal, we're, we're working with urban systems to assess the damage to the water systems. Uh, we'd like to have a plan to uh, fix the water systems while we're doing the groundwork for the remediation project. So again, trying to coordinate the activities so that you know we don't go uh, two steps forward and one step back. Um, I think on the water system, there have been, again, some movement that has been positive that do not consume order has been lifted, I think, through a lot of diligence for, from your public works department, also Interior Health, First Nations Health Authority. Lytton First Nation has been a huge partner to this, uh, and other folks have been really working hard on trying to get that done. I think the priority is to um, keep that water treatment plant working, provide water to the residents in Lytton that are still there, uh, and then you know deal with the issues with the water system around the town site and some of the other leakage items that we're, we're seeing. Um, we're also trying to get contractors in place. And so uh, those contractors, we're looking into who's got capacity uh, and the availability to support your public works department, uh, first and foremost, but also the capacity to come in, uh, mobilize into Lytton and support some of the, the uh, in infrastructure improvements. Um, and also we're looking at some redundancy. So backup power for the water treatment plant, backup power for the wells. Um, and then we're, you know, pretty, uh, 
conscious that the next rain event or, or freshet, which is possibly happening right now, is probably going to create another debris, debris flow um, into the intake for your water system. So trying to uh, work with external entities and the public works department to create some contingency planning to make sure that we can maintain um, safe quality water for the community. Uh, I think that's my summary for today. I'm certainly happy to answer questions. I'm sure there are questions and I, I may not have covered it all um, concisely enough for everybody. So I'm, I'm happy to address direct questions people may have. And I know we're going to uh, save questions uh, for um, the conclusion of this section. Um, but I do know there will be questions. So I do want to address one quick one I saw in the um, uh, chat that sort of referenced uh, my remarks earlier. And uh, that is other municipalities, like people have seen progress in Merritt, in Abbotsford, in, in other places like that. And um, Parliamentary Secretary Rice actually alluded to this when she said that the current legislation is written in a way where it is up to the local government or local authority first to, um, to start addressing the emergency and start addressing some of the repairs and mitigation and, and recovery, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, uh, Lytton um, is uh, unique perhaps in some ways in that there are some limited resources um, to fund all of those recovery efforts. And the legislation is not written, you know, in that way where um, we need to sort of go to the province. So we've sort of had to, in addition, uh, sort of invent a new, <laughs> a new um, process whereby we have to go to the government and the provincial government and uh, ask for this funding. So that I think helps to explain somewhat um, why, you know, we might see other communities may be um, on the road to recovery a little bit faster um, because they have the, the resources that that Lytton might might not might not have at this time. So uh, with that, I'll move on very quickly to um, an update on the emergency housing uh, piece. Right now, I am uh, working with our data and we are looking at um, presenting a ask on the interim housing uh, uh, piece. Right now, we don't have sufficient data that we could take to our funding partners uh, on interim housing, but uh, we are working on that and we will be able to share more information on that, I expect, in the next couple of weeks. Um, in terms of the financial update, uh, Terry Hawes, did you want to provide a short update, please? Thanks, Allison. Thank, hello, everybody, and um, thank you for coming. Uh, my update is really short. I just want to sp spend two minutes on financial matters, in particular the property taxes. Um, at the end of December, we remailed out all the the property tax notices for 2021, and um, and I've had a number of people connect with us um, asking for email copies. And and certainly, if you're not receiving your mail. Um, please reach out to me um, um, either at finance at litton.ca or cfo at litton.ca. Happy to email those over to you. And um, just another update is that we're, we're, we're working with uh, our bank, being Scotia Bank, to have the ability to, to um, do online payments directly in terms of and entering your roll number to pay your property taxes. And I'm just waiting for some, some replies from Scotia Bank. And so that should be in place. I would hope in the next week. So um, thank you so much. And in, in the interim, you're more than welcome to send checks to the regular mailing address at PO Box 100, uh, 380 Main Street, Lytton, BC. And um, we're getting the mail from Canada Post. I think there's a there's a presentation coming up shortly from uh, I think Ben from Canada Post, so he can talk more about that. But um, yeah, so that's that's my update in terms of the the, the finances. Um, you know, we do we do require the property taxes to be paid. Um, we're working with the province in terms of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, writing off penalties and and interest for 2021. We have to 
have a resolution by mayor and council to request that from the province, which will happen um, most likely at the June 26th council meeting. Um, and then we're subject to approval from the province. Um, and having said all that, um, the, there, there has to be a limitation to the timeline. And so what we've established is June 30th, 2022. So the, pro the interest on overdue property tax started to accrue January 1st. We're gonna be asking the province to write it off up until June 30th, but if it goes beyond that, then the interest will be due and payable. So thank you for your support on that and, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Allison. Thank you so much, Terry. And again, we'll leave the questions uh, to the end. And my apologies, everyone, I skipped over uh, the essential services uh, section. Um, and that is, uh, will be updates from uh, Canada Post and the RCMP. And I will, I know that uh, folks are anxiously awaiting the Canada Post update. So uh, Ben, I will uh, hand the floor over to you, please. Thank you, and sorry Great. about that. Oh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. I appreciate being invited on behalf of Canada Post uh, to update uh, everyone in the community. I'd first like to let everybody know I'm coming to you today from New Westminster which is the traditional territory of the Kaikite First Nation. Um, and uh, I just would like to, to also uh, thank uh, everybody um, uh, for their, their patience and understanding. We were extremely excited at Canada Post to have the temporary post office open ahead of schedule on December 22nd. Uh, and then um, as everybody knows, we had some unforeseen circumstances uh, related to staffing, um, the two individuals who were going to, to staff that, that post office, uh, things came up. And of course, um, the inclement weather and the, uh, the highway closures uh, also have been a challenge. Um, and uh, again, I know there's been a lot of frustration with uh, having been open for that first week and then being subsequently closed. And I want to apologize on behalf of Canada Post. Uh, I, we fully understand that uh, myself being the, the manager of government community affairs of British Columbia, that in rural and remote communities, the post office isn't uh, just a post office, it, it's a vital resource uh, for small businesses, for people to, for commerce, uh, just to get your mail, but also it's a galvanizing force in the community, uh, a community hub, if you will. Um, so we were uh, crestfallen that, that we had to close that um, uh, temporarily. Um, I will say, however, that we, we are excited that we have two new uh, term hires that have been engaged. Um, regrettably, one lives in Boston Bar, and because of the recent road closures to Highway 12, they haven't been able to get to Linton. Um, the other person is in process to be hired. They're going through the, the paperwork, the due diligence, the background checks, uh, and then they'll go through some accelerated training. So they'll be spooled up very soon. Uh, and then we'll also have an additional term hire. I uh, just have three people to be able to uh, uh, staff that temporary post office. I'll also quickly add that again, the post office you see now at the gas station won't be the, the long-term temporary post office, if I can say that. Uh, we'll have a much larger trailer, a 60-foot trailer, that'll be fully equipped and accessible. Uh, and as soon as we're able to bring that down from Prince George uh, with uh, the word from, from the highways, uh, from Ministry of Transport, uh, we'll be bringing that down and putting it in place. Um, but uh, I can say that uh, Litton mail uh, is currently being held in Kamloops. Uh, mail parcels can still be picked up at the retail counter uh, at the, the depot in Kamloops at uh, 1350 Dahousie Drive. I know there was an instance where some folks went up there and they were told they couldn't get their mail. And again, I'm profoundly ap I apologize for that. We had an instance where we had, we were, ha we're dealing with uh, an overwhelming amount of our frontline staff having COVID uh, positive. When that happens, we have to shut down a facility for sanitization. Uh, in this instance, some folks went up there and we had a case, so we weren't able to access the room that the mail was in. So I apologize to anybody who went through that, but I've confirmed uh, repeatedly uh, leading into this meeting that mail can be picked up uh, in Kamloops for the time being. I can also let you know that um, we just heard uh, that there will be a highway reopening um, from Spence's Bridge to Lytton. So based on that information, our local operations team will be bringing in a, a clerk to support the post office Friday, tomorrow. Uh, so tomorrow morning will be a great opportunity for those within the community to pick up their mail and parcels that are currently in the trailer now. So tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Uh, should be open for business um, and we'll have a clerk there uh, tomorrow through the day. Um, so it's a great chance to get your mail. Uh, regrettably, uh, I don't have a definitive date as to when it will be fully open. 
uh, with the new staff. I anticipate in the, sometime soon in the next coming weeks. I will channel that information to the various folks I've been speaking with and with the, uh, the biweekly community stakeholders uh, meeting as well. Um, and we're very excited to, once we get through this, that it'll be open right through. Again, it's a very important to the community. You folks have been through so much and, and we're sorry that we haven't been able to explicitly offer our services to you. Uh, so with that, I'll wait till the, the question period and happily answer any questions best I can uh, on behalf of our operations team. So again, thank you very much. Um, and then we look forward to serving you very soon. Thank you so much, Ben, for that update. I'll uh, pass it over to uh, Sergeant Clay now with the RCMP. Hi there. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, so updates for the RCMP. Uh, we still remain hubbed out of both Lytton and Lillooet. We still have our three members working and living in Lytton up on their places of Loring Way. They are still working out of their homes. <clears throat> I had hoped to have the temporary detachment uh, in place before Christmas, but we went a few delays. So with the temporary detachment, um, the land has been conveyed over now from the province to Lytton First Nation, and we're just waiting for the registration. We are still actively working with ATCO and um, with our internal uh, departments to prepare for that move. Uh, the timeline that I received that we're working on right now for my project team is uh, we're hoping to start a relocation within four weeks. So middle of February is kind of what I'm shooting on here right now, and then we can get our upfit. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to have this office running by the early spring. Um, when we had the last meeting, I believe I'd made reference to us wanting to do some safety work uh, around the site of our three staff houses and the old attachment that uh, was impacted by the fire. We had hoped to be able to make that area a little bit safer just by pushing in the buildings and pulling them. Uh, we were advised yesterday by our contractor uh, that uh, we're not going to be able to get this done during the winter. Uh, just the safety reasons popped up with the hazmat and some of their precautions they have to put in place. So that project has been put on hold now until the spring. Obviously, if I get any changes on that, I will message and convey that out to uh, whatever form we have to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. We are still actively working and planning down the road. Um, we know that we lost three staff houses. We know that we lost a detachment. So we are working in the background here with our project teams, with our senior management and with, uh, with our partners to make plans for what that will look like, what our rebuild is going to look like, what we're going to have there. So uh, I don't have anything right now concrete with that. Just want to let everybody know that uh, we're working long term to uh, be back, be bigger, be better. And with that, I'll wait till uh, the end of the forum to ask any question anybody has. That's great. Thank you so much, Sergeant Clay. Really appreciate your, your time this evening. Uh, we have two more updates and then I know there's a lot of questions. Uh, we're gonna open up the floor. Um, the economy, we have uh, Deborah Arnott here from Community Futures to provide an update. Over Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm not able to put on my camera because I'm working from home, so my apologies. Just to uh, remind everyone, uh, Community Futures has set up a business incubator in the Lytton Resiliency Centre. There's three computers with a printer and a scanner, and businesses are more than welcome to um, go in and use all of the equipment that they need. We also uh, found some funding to hire two full-time individuals. I've received a resume from one um, individual in the community, so I'll be reaching out to that person tomorrow and hopefully have that individual in the Business Resiliency Centre working. I also want to remind the businesses that are on the call that um, we do have our regional business liaison and that's Daphne Nelson and I'll ask her to put her contact information in the chat. Um, and also we have a team of industry experts that can provide one-on-one -on -one support. I wanna remind everybody that the, all these services are free. So please do not hesitate to reach out and get any kind of support you need through this transition. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you very much, Allison. 
Thank you so much, um, Deb. We really appreciate all the work you're doing in the community, both yourself and Daphne, uh, very much. And uh, I know that business incubator is uh, up and running for anyone who would like to uh, take advantage of that. Um, next on my uh, list is a local government update. And I just wanted to provide a very quick um, update on the recovery team. Um, as James sort of alluded to, we, we got a bit of a rough start um, on this recovery, but um, I, since uh, our project team has sort of filled out, I came on board on November 3rd. Um, James came on board at near the end of November. Um, and we've been building our team uh, since then. And we've, we've you know, tried to put a lot of uh, work plans and structures and things in place that we're happy to share with, with the community. Uh, so watch for those uh, to be posted uh, shortly. We also have a number of engagement opportunities. Um, in addition to this um, venue in the town hall, we also have our citizens advisory committee, which meets biweekly. Um, the next meeting I believe is January 19th. And we encourage uh, folks to come and observe. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the committee members are the, are the ones that will be uh, active participants on that meeting, but we encourage uh, everybody to observe and, and uh, learn more about uh, some of the processes around some of the upcoming um, bylaw changes and official community plan and, and long-term recovery planning. So, um, in addition to that, we have our YouTube page, of course, that we have uh, up and running and all of the recorded uh, council meeting minutes and committee meeting minutes, including the Citizens Advisory Committee are posted there. Um, I'm trying to think, I, I have an old copy of the agenda with me, so I apologize if, if I'm missing anything, but uh, I think we may be ready to open it up uh, Jasmine for questions. Great, that sounds good. So we'll now open it up to all questions on all topics. So if you do have a question, please use the chat box and we can uh, go through them until we run out of time. You can also raise your hand on Zoom to speak out loud, uh, which we highly recommend so that we can see you and hear you. Um, for those of you who have already sent in your questions, thank you so much. Um, I know that many of them have been responded to by staff in advance of the meeting, but we'll still try to cover as many as we possibly can today. Um, and any questions both that you send now or had sent in advance that we aren't able to get to just because of time, um, those are gonna be included in the written Q&A that will follow after the meeting uh, within the next um, about week. So I see Denise O'Connor's hand raised right now. So let's just jump right over to there. Um, Denise, I'll ask you to unmute now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm on a PR at the Resiliency Center with uh, somebody else. I'm watching the, the town hall. I have a question for Canada Post, please. Uh, I told that I went to the post office this morning to ask if I could pick up my mail. And they told me I'd go ahead and have some of it. They said, of course, I can't pick up the mail. It's at the Lynn Post Office, so I'm happy to hear tomorrow we'll be able to do that. But they also said there's lots of mail that's been processed already, and we can't get that. We can only get the mail that's coming very recently. So what is the plan for us to get that mail that is sitting in a limbo, not, a Lynn, not available at Dallas? Um, lots of people in Lynn here I know. I've talked to people that are expecting checks in the mail. Um, for their um, you know, pension and all sorts of things that don't have direct deposit. So, yeah, I think it's really important that we are able to access all of our meals. So how do we get that? Thank you. Sure. So that question's for Ben, and it was just a little bit difficult to hear, but I think the question uh, is surrounding the mail that has been sitting there. What's the process to pick that up? Yeah, I think I, I, think I heard it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why that's being communicated. Uh, it was told to me from the local area superintendent um, that any and all mail should be available for folks um, that is at the Dalhousie uh, Depot. 
Um, so what I'll do is uh, first thing tomorrow is uh, ensure that that's possible. Um, I can't think, again, I'm not operations, um, but I don't understand. I can't think of why some mail would be held if it's been processed and if it's there, uh, and the, the, the room that's cordoned off for Lytton residence mail, why you shouldn't be able to have access to that. So uh, I'll make a note, I'll inquire right away and ensure that people can, can go and get their mail and parcels without any problems. Uh, and, I, and I apologize for the frustration um, in terms of uh, the, the mail that is in the, in the trailer, again, tomorrow's a great day and, and, and to get that mail, those mail and parcels. And then going forward, once we have that staff in place, which again will be very soon, mail will then be channeled uh, directly to that lit and trailer for, for pickup. Uh, but again, in the interim, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that tomorrow morning I call the depot and, and make sure people can get all access to their, their mail and parcels that have been processed through and uh, are in that, that waiting room. Thank you. You're on mute, Jasmine. Of course, had to happen once in, in the day, hey? Um, I was just saying, Ben, while I have you, I have a couple more questions for you. The first is, will they charge for mail or will Canada Post be charging for mail? Uh, so the, the, I just, the, the mail forwarding, those who have, then the free mail forwarding and those who are interested in free mail forwarding, that will still be offered uh, free of charge. Um, but the other suite of services, um, I haven't been made aware that there was any, anything uh, in terms of not, not charging for, for mail and parcel delivery. So all of that slot is, is charged, but the free mail forwarding will still be available. Great. And then uh, another question here for you is, how will you be communicating with area residents um, moving forward? That's a good question. So obviously things are very touch and go, or they have been these, these past two weeks. Um, do, doing our best uh, through forums such as this, we're talking to uh, the administrator of the, the First Nation, Jackie, uh, to make sure that she's very extremely helpful. I can't thank her enough for trying to uh, sort of channel or, or relay communications uh, to the First Nations through to their various uh, communications channels. So just uh, sort of picking up the phone and talking to those stakeholders who I've talked to in the community um, to sort of relay messaging. Um, that's the, really the best we can do at, at this juncture. And of course, uh, the village, of course, is uh, able to share those messages on our social media and our website as well. And uh, we do our best to get those out properly. Perfect. Um, and I see Noni's hand raised. So Noni McCann, I'm gonna ask you to unmute now. Hi, that, um, <laughs> that's the big question about everything. Everything, everything, everything. How are people going to know what, what media, what medium, how are people, the big question is constantly repeating, how are we going to know that? How are you going to tell us that? How are we going to find out that? All of the information about all of the things, like is this meeting the only way to find out what's going on? or like James is making a plan. Boy, would I ever love to know where I can find James's plan. Would I ever like to know where I could see the organizational chart that um, Jennifer Rice referred to when she spoke? Like, where is all this stuff? And it, it, when questions can be answered and people can see, then it lowers the whole anxiety and the whole stress and you can kind of feel like okay now I get what's going on and but as long as you're wondering and you have no answers it just kind of creates that uh, energy of of angst I think so if there's any plan to to find some way to let people know about oh I know there's a million different things going on and they're happening all the time and how can we effectively get that information and kind of make people feel a lot better about what's happening because I think there is stuff going on I mean look at town and it looks like nothing's going on but there's stuff going on all the time that no one really knows and it's it, it's actually very helpful stuff so that's my question and answer at the same time thanks thank you so much Noni and uh, we certainly appreciate that people want to know what's going to happen when and how long is that particular thing going to take and and uh, with respect to the org chart uh, we did post a simplified org chart um, as a part of, uh, I think, the first Q&A document. Um, I'm happy to expand on that. 
um, and uh, work with Parliamentary Secretary Rice on that um, and have that posted in the upcoming Q&A uh, document to flesh it out a little bit. Um, in terms of the work plan, again, um, because, you know, Frank, as we sort of spoke about, this project team has been, you know, really, really working very, very hard on developing this project plan. Um, but keep in mind, this pro this particular project team has only been sort of working on this project for about a month. When you think that, you know, James started at the end of November, um, and then we went through the holiday season and, and things like that. So we're, we're getting there and we have a really solid start on a work plan and uh, we're all about transparency. We are happy to share that um, when it's finalized. Great, thanks Allison. Uh, so our next question, we have a number that have come in or that were sent in advance. Um, so the first one here, I believe, this one might be for James. Um, has Braille been considered as an option for debris removal? And if not, why? Um, yeah, uh, from it's James here. Uh, yeah, from what I understand, it has been. Um, Cameron Bowen is on the call who's, who's been looking at it. Um, I don't know if he wants to talk to a bit more. I know Jason Robertson, um, counselor with, with, with Lytton First Nation has also looked into it. So I think there's been a number of entities, a number of coordinated bodies that have reached out and looked into it. I think there's some complications, one being that there's not a siding, there's not a like a transload facility on CN or CP currently in Lytton. Um, and so when the atmospheric rivers wiped out the, the roads, I know this was a scramble and a question, could we just do this? Um, also, there are some issues with just the hauling of hazardous materials in rail cars and acceptable sort of liners that go in them. So I guess the short answer is, yeah, it's definitely being looked at. And I don't think it's being um, totally um, removed as an option at this point. Um, I do think there are other options as the roads open up that might be more effective um, and easier to manage and coordinate at this point. Um, but it's, it's certainly still on the table and still being looked at and, and still being discussed. Great, thanks James. Uh, we have a question, another question about debris removal. Um, so it says it was stated that the province is paying for debris removal. Please clarify if that is for individual homeowner properties who have, um, who have and who have not insurance. Uh, thanks for that, Jasmine, and uh, hoping it's okay that I jump into this one. Um, so for those that don't know me, my name is Darlene Clark, and I'm a manager for community recovery with Emergency Management BC. And uh, you've heard lots of um, lots of great articulation from some of the leadership from the province and just wanted to jump into this very operational question. So yeah, the question was around clarifying if uh, individual homeowner properties who have and who have not insurance and if the homeowners need to hire their own contractors. So there's three distinctions of properties within the village of Lytton, and I, I hope you understand I'm trying to be as respectful as possible in these descriptions. There's insured municipal infrastructure, insured private property, and there's uninsured private property. And so the province was able to negotiate agreements with our partners, the Canadian Red Cross and the Thompson Nicola Regional District to support the debris removal for the uninsured properties within the village of Lytton. The insurance property owners will work with their insurance companies on the debris removal for their properties. So what we're hoping will happen and what we're working towards um, under James High's leadership as a project manager for the Village of Lytton is collaborative workings between the Village of Lytton's recovery team, the insurance companies and their contractors for debris removal, as well as the Thompson Nicola Regional District's debris removal contractors. So those are some of the conversations that are happening in the background. And we, when we talk about getting close to the point of debris removal and the difference between smaller unincorporated communities like Monty Lake and larger communities like the village of Lytton, it's really that collaboration between the, um, the multi-organizations 
And uh, yeah, really happy to see the Villages team come together and working towards those opportunities. Happy to answer any follow-up questions to that, Jasmine, before I uh, unmute. Um, none that I can see right now, but maybe I'll call on you again if I see any. <laughs> Thanks, Darlene. Thank you. Um, our next question here, and we've received a couple iterations of this question, um, is that, uh, my insurance adjuster informed me uh, that they are waiting on details about what will be required to obtain a demolition permit to begin site clearing. So why is there such a delay for, uh, for insurance companies to obtain demolition permits? That question would be uh, best answered by Ron Dickinson, who is our building and planning development director. Unfortunately, uh, he has a relative uh, in the hospital uh, that was just uh, admitted uh, this evening, unfortunately. Um, so if it's possible, um, we'd like to take that away and answer it on the Q&A document. Um, if there's anyone else from the team, uh, Ron Matuzzi, I'm not sure if you're able to answer that one. Uh, could, I, could I have the question again, sorry. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, the, the question is about insurance agencies um, or insurance companies obtaining demolition permits and why there's such a delay. Well, I, I think we've heard already about the, the two areas that are have to be put in place. One is the heritage permit and the other is uh, dealing with contaminated sites, atmospheric river, you know, roads uh, being down and now uh, snow. Um, there is a permit process uh, in place and I think that the um, that uh, if the insurance company applies or the, or the contractor they've hired, um, there's really kind of a three phase type of process. And if it's from if it's sur superficial debris removal, uh, what the committee is asked is that people um, apply, and and they'd have to apply showing where they're going to be, what they're going to remove, and and they'd also have to comply obviously with things like uh, workman's uh, worksafe vc which of course these contractors all know because they do that for a living uh, but that kind of information they then uh, 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 would let uh, ron dickinson or the heritage committee uh, know and from that it's ascertained whether or not they actually need a demolition permit or could they just remove debris so if, for example if what they wanted to remove was uh, burnt out vehicles well that might be something that would be immediately granted uh, what we need, though, is just to get some idea of what people are doing on the sites, because it is a uh, hazardous site. We have to make sure that uh, whoever's doing the work uh, is able to conduct the work. So the, the, everything is in place at this point in time. Now, the issuance of, uh, of a demolition permit and removal of debris, uh, like I said, I think it could, could happen uh, quite quickly, as long as there's no super, uh, superficial disturbance. Um, the building permit obviously is waiting for the building bylaw, and uh, so uh, Ron couldn't uh, couldn't issue a building permit, but he certainly could issue uh, uh, some form of demolition, depending on what the nature of the demolition is. So it's a, it's a case by case basis now. Great, thanks, Ron. And I'd also encourage uh, folks uh, to look at their individual insurance policies. Uh, each policy is different. Um, with regards to what it covers. So I'd encourage folks to investigate that with their insurance providers. Great. Uh, the next question uh, is about the two positions, uh, the admin and communications position uh, that were posted and were, um, we were trying to be filled by local candidates. So folks are wondering what the status of these positions are. And then there's actually also a question about the economic development officer position. So I was wondering if you could just cover all three, Allison. You bet. So uh, we did receive a number of applicants for all three positions, actually. Um, I'll just speak to the administrative and communications support positions. Um, I did prepare a brief uh, for uh, consideration uh, by our uh, staff member who is in, uh, responsible for staffing, and uh, she will be uh, looking into that and, and conducting uh, the next steps on that. Unfortunately, um, she is sick right now with COVID. 
Um, so we're, of course, hoping for her speedy recovery. Um, with regards to the economic development officer position, that position was put on hold for a short time. Uh, but I'm happy to say at uh, council meeting last night, uh, we did receive a direction to uh, proceed with that with that posting. So we should um, see some uh, further action on that shortly as well. That's great. Thanks, Allison. Um, there is just a question about taxes. So Terry, I'm wondering if you could uh, take this one. Um, I'm just wondering if you could explain uh, the tax process one more time. Uh, it just wasn't totally clear. Thanks, Jasmine. Yeah, I, I replied to the person who made the comment, and I'm really not understanding the question. So <clears throat> maybe I'll re-articulate re um, the process as I understand the question, and hopefully that, that that's what they're looking for. So essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, the tax notices um, should have been received by property owners prior to the fire. And clearly many of them were destroyed in the fire. So, so once we got through the data rebuild to the point where we could recreate them, we did and we remailed to all the property owners, their tax notices for 2021 in the last week of December. And so um, the vast majority of them are unpaid. And so we're looking for property owners to remit their taxes for 2021. And, and um, if there's any questions, they can email, call, um, and, and let us know what their questions are. But um, the notices are there, they've been mailed, happy to email them to them if required. Um, and again, the other part about the due date is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the tax notices have the original due dates printed on the tax notices. Um, and so we're gonna be applying, we, the, the, the village applying to the province to allow us to write off penalties and, and interest up to and including June 30th 2022 only. So, so if you don't pay your taxes by June 30th, 2022, um, then interest will start to accrue and will be due and payable. So I'm, I'm hoping that describes the process. And if I've missed anything, please let me know. Great. Thanks so much. That was helpful. Um, I have a few, few questions here, Allison, related to interim or temporary housing. Um, so the first is, is just mostly a comment that um, because it'll be a little bit longer before people can rebuild, um, is interim housing going to be a priority? And then regarding temporary or interim housing, um, how do we have to apply and will there be eligibility requirements? And how long will it take if you have that information? Yeah, interim housing is absolutely a priority. Um, the issue is that the the data we have right now doesn't support a widespread need for interim housing. But having said that, I'm hearing that, you know, folks really do need that interim housing. So we're looking at alternate sources to compile that data uh, because, you know, um, to be frank, uh, the government um, at any level is, probably not going to support uh, in terms of funding for, um, for anything we can't prove a need for, right? And we don't have those numbers, concrete numbers right now. So we are working on getting those. I'm, going, I'm working with uh, the Interior Health Authority. I'm working with Statistics Canada, working with BC Housing, working with the Enlakakma uh, peoples. And I'm working with um, our, our other funding partners uh, to develop a really comprehensive strategy um, that will also feed into our medium and long-term recovery planning processes. So um, unfortunately, I don't have any timelines on it, but uh, with regards to you know, uh, the interim housing, we'll, we'll need to ensure that the site that is chosen is is safe and and all of that for for folks to reside. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is about passing of bylaws. Um, so, how does the passing of bylaws process actually work, and does the community have a say, or is it solely up to mayor and council? Um, the community 
does have a say and the best practice uh, that we recommend is for you know, extensive community consultation. Having said that, the ultimate uh, decision is made by mayor and council. Great, thanks so much. Um, question about the draft short-term recovery plan. So folks are saying that they haven't received that many updates on the short-term recovery plan. Um, albeit I, you provided many today, so maybe that answers the question. Um, but will there be an updated document? And then also a question about Fraser Basin Council and if they're still leading the, the development of that document. Uh, we're working with um, a proposal from Fraser Basin Council. And um, of course, uh, the mayor and council will need to uh, sign off on that proposal that is in progress right now. Um, I think that um, the, it's important, you know, uh, throughout uh, the updates and the short term recovery planning uh, process to be sure that we involve the community at every step. So uh, that's my priority in, in the development of the medium and long-term uh, recovery planning process. And with regards to the short-term recovery plan, I provide an update uh, probably at, usually at every council meeting and at every uh, citizens advisory committee meeting um, regarding the uh, short-term recovery plan update. And anybody has, that has any questions about it is more than welcome to email me personally as well. It's aposte at litton.ca. So I look forward to hearing your questions. I just dropped it in the chat for everyone there too. Um, so there is a question or a few comments about um, the process for, for locals to be really considered for the positions, for those three positions. Um, and I believe Darlene um, can speak to this a little bit. Yeah, thanks for that, Jasmine. And just wanting to jump in to talk a little bit about some technical technicalities around uh, the provincial funding for this. Um, so as you know, the recovery efforts for the village of Lytton are vast and they come with an enormity of costs. And so those costs come through um, the, the opening gate would be Emergency Management BC. And then we work with our partners, our ministry partners to identify if there's any available funding. And so if I was to speak specifically to the administrative and the communications position in working with our ministry partners, had consultation with the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction, and we were able to find funding through their Job Creation Partnership Program. So the Job Creation Partnership Program, I won't go into too many details, it's not my ministry and I don't wanna take a misstep, but what I do wanna say is those programs work through the Work BC offices. So they're geared towards creating employment experience for those that are on um, employment insurance or working with their Work BC offices. So the administrative position and the communications officer are going to run through those programs. And what I would encourage is um, check with your local Work BC office. And my understanding and Deb are not happy to take your comments on this as an expert. My understanding is Ashcroft is the nearest Work BC office, and there is also another one in Merritt. Um, so again, Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction is a great partner in supporting the funding towards the administrative and the communications position. And it's gonna be through the Job Creation Partnership Program, and we're really happy to be working with that partner. That's great. Thank you so much, Darlene. Um, just scroll into the next question here. Um, is there an update on ambulance and other medical essential services? Uh, good question. I think I saw that uh, Kathy Hibberson was here on the call. Um, Kathy, if you're here, if you want to raise your hand, um, I can unmute you. Might be easier than me trying to find you. <laughs> Is there anyone else here from uh, BC Ambulance or perhaps, oh, there she is. Perfect. There you go, Kathy, you should be able to unmute. 
Hi, sorry about that. I was having uh, issues finding my raised hand. Um, I don't have any updates at this time. Our next meeting regarding the ambulance station is tomorrow. And I'm hoping to get more information out uh, after tomorrow's meeting. Perfect, that sounds good. We'll look out for that. Thanks, Kathy. And I'm happy to post uh, any update on the uh, our social media or the website as well. If you want to pass that along, Kathy. Thank you. And then I just see Jackie's hand raised so we can jump on over to you, Jackie. I'll ask you to unmute now. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Jackie Raphael and I am the lands manager with uh, um, working for the First Nation. Uh, just a, a, a little bit more update on the, the BC ambulance is that um, uh, originally we had thought that we would um, have a temporary um, uh, office um, set up by the health center but um, they have put in an ask to have a more permanent structure put in place. So that's gonna take a little bit more time than what we originally thought. We thought that we'd have something in place by the middle of January, but of course with the roads um, down and everything, they, they couldn't get their um, everything in in time. So that's kind of where it's at. Um, we are looking at uh, having a very temporary, temporary, um, possibly um, a trailer going in up at the health center uh, in the next few weeks. So uh, that will be in discussions tomorrow and we'll, we'll find out more about that. They, they um, are aware of the urgency of uh, getting something in, in place. So we're, we're working really hard at um, uh, getting those services uh, up and running quite quickly. Perfect. Thank you so, so much, Jackie, and thanks for being here with us. All right, the next question here um, is for you, Allison. So I think there is some confusion over what interim housing is. Uh, initially, many of us thought that it would be for one to two years, but now it appears it might be two to three years or four years. Um, just hoping you can shed some light on that. Yeah, of course. Um, because we don't have the uh, data from the survey, we really don't know what the length of time required uh, would be for the interim housing uh, need. Um, we know it's there. Uh, we're just trying to go and find, you know, the the information to support it. And in the process of the medium and long term recovery planning. Uh, consultations with the community, we're going to be uh, finding out more of that information. I, I know that's not probably the answer you want, but um, that's, that's kind of where we're at. We, we, don't, we don't know right now until okay. we have a consultation. Thank you. Um, the next question is, would the Citizens Advisory Committee or the Village Council invite people with expertise and fire monitoring and prevention systems to speak about what could be done to protect Lytonites from possible future fires? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, the people we have had so far uh, at the community citizens advisory committee meeting to speak have included uh, those from the building standards uh, branch, um, the director of our development uh, process, uh, folks that have spoken on the step code process. And at our next meeting on January 19th, there will be representatives from the Insurance Bureau of Canada to answer questions. So certainly um, I can uh, bring that topic to the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee and have our chair uh, look at, you know, uh, bringing somebody in to address that particular topic. So I'm happy to do that. Thanks, and I see Ron's hand is up. Ron, do you wanna to speak to that more? Uh, yeah, thank you. Just as an addition, one of the things that'll, that'll go through council and then uh, likely onto the CAC is a report we've now received from the Institute uh, for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. 
who've actually analyzed the building bylaw and have come forward with uh, a series of recommendations. Uh, the, the country has just adopted a new uh, wildfire fire uh, standard, uh, which they are suggesting uh, we take a look at uh, to see if it uh, uh, could be implemented uh, within Lytton. So that's another piece of the puzzle. Uh, so the information is available. Um, the, the standard has just been published and has not been implemented anywhere. So um, it'll be, um, uh, the information will be forwarded to council and then uh, uh, I'm sure run through the CAC with an explanation of what it is and uh, eventually uh, could be integrated as uh, part of the new building bylaw. Perfect, thanks Ron. Um, the next question is uh, for existing homes that are still standing in Lytton, is it correct to assume that any renovations would fall under the same standards as the downtown core? Could you clarify this for us? I'm sorry, uh, Jasmine, would you mind repeating the question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for existing homes that are still standing in Lytton, is it correct to assume that any renovations would fall under the same standards as the downtown core? Yes. So any um, any uh, buildings within the municipal boundary of the village of Lytton are bound by the uh, building bylaws in place. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, the next question here. Um, Sorry, just scrolling through them all. Um, are there any discussions about reopening the airport? With the closure of roads and no supplies being shipped in, the airport could be a resource if it's available. I haven't heard any update uh, to that effect, but we can take that away and uh, provide, an, uh, provide an answer in the Q&A document. Great, thank you. Um, there's a bit of a question about bylaw 750 and wondering if they could get an update on consultation. Uh, it says the community has not yet been consulted. Um, is this being pushed forward without being meaning without meaningful consultation with the community? Uh, the community or the citizens advisory committee is looking very closely at uh, the building bylaw. We also, which is only one of the venues that will be um, offered to citizens um, as as a, as this bylaw proceeds. Um, it's very much in the draft stage, uh, I want to emphasize, and uh, there are a number of community consultations uh, that I believe will be taking place uh, in, the, in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, we understand that BC Hydro was having a meeting with the village recently to discuss reinstalling hydro, including weather wires that would go underground or above ground. Uh, can we get an update on what happened at this meeting and whether or not decisions were made? You bet. Um, I was in that meeting. Uh, no decisions were made. Uh, those decisions are made by mayor and council. Um, what BC Hydro indicated to us is there would be no charge uh, for restoration of the overhead power lines as they were at the time of the fire. Uh, there would be a charge for uh, doing the underground utilities and uh, it would take, um, according to BC Hydro, they're uh, getting finalized numbers to us, but uh, they indicated it would take probably about an extra year to do the underground utilities versus doing the over, overhead. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next question is uh, a bit of a big one and we might need to take this back, but if this site requires years of decontamination work, um, and since the village is so vulnerable to fires, as history indicates, would the village consider relocating? That's a very big question, um, way beyond my pay grade. <laughs> um, that would need to be a, a decision of mayor and council. Thanks. Um, 
we have a lot of information uh, that the town is contaminated, but we have 24-7 uh, security people getting in and out of their cars. Why is it safe for these folks and not the rest of us? Um, I, I don't know that to be the case. Um, I can take that away. Um, I know Owen Collings is our site support person and uh, he's on the ground every day uh, himself and is a long-term resident of the Lytton area. So uh, Owen, are you available to answer that question? Hi, I'm here. There you go. Hi, Owen. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, as far as I know, the security guards all wear their uh, N95 masks, like everybody that's going around the village. Most of the time they're in their in their trucks and cars with the windows closed, uh, especially during this kind of weather. Uh, they don't really come out unless they have to. They're not walking around near, near as much as I am when I'm there. And uh, right now, because of the snow, there's really not much airborne contamination and anything that would be there, you could be protected by your N95 mask. Um, it's only when you're working with the actually, you know, close to the debris that you require the P100 respirators with the filters on them and any hazmat suits. Uh, so if they're walking around without their masks on and someone sees it, they should maybe remind them. Uh, I certainly would, uh, but they've never done that in front of me while I was there. I'm, I'm not there 24 seven. I still have a life when I live over here on the west side. <laughs> I mean, I, I am in town when I'm needed. Uh, but there hasn't been much occasion to be there recently with all the snow. Uh, there is no debris removal going on at present because of the conditions. So uh, the short answer is they should be wearing their mask like everybody and they should have their windows rolled up in their truck just like it tells you on the sign when you're driving through on Main Street. I don't know if that answers your question, hopefully. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you so much, Owen. Sure. And it's 8.55 right now, so maybe we'll just take one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, uh, the top question that I have here is, uh, will a fire smart fence be placed between the railway and town? Um, that would certainly uh, be a recommendation that we could put uh, to the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, to provide perhaps a recommendation to council. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Um, so on that note there, uh, I actually think we got through most of the questions. There are just uh, a few more, but we're gonna make sure that we capture those and any of the ones that we weren't able to answer today. And, and we'll put those in the Q&A document and, and get answers to those and get those posted pretty quickly here. Um, so on that note, Allison, I'm going to turn it back over to you just to do some closing remarks and maybe speak about the next meeting. Thank you so, so much, Jasmine, um, for all your work moderating. And we really, really appreciate your um, excellent service to the village of Lytton. It's very much appreciated. Um, I know that, you know, what you've heard uh, tonight um, may not be you know exactly what you wanted to hear but I think it's very important and um, the entire project team feels it's important that we uh, give um, the realistic updates to village residents and realistic timelines that uh, incorporate all of the uh, requirements that we need to to do on behalf uh, of the of the village and because and in compliance with all of our um, required legislation. So I know that you know we'd all like uh, this process to move faster, um, but uh, I hope uh, folks can appreciate that the timelines that we are putting out are realistic. And uh, as James mentioned the other day um, in a meeting, we had a number of missed milestones, unfortunately, in the past few months. And we are putting plans together to ensure that we don't miss the next milestones. So I think that that's really critical and really key. And um, yeah, that I'll uh, conclude there. And 
We've done a lot of work again. I said this last time since the last meeting, and I'm sure we'll do a lot more uh, before the next one. That will be held on Thursday, February 24th, 2022. And I look forward to seeing everybody then. Um, and please feel free to reach out and engage on our various uh, channels through YouTube, through the Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, through email, through social media, through the website. Please uh, reach out to us. Thanks, Allison. Um, and just to reiterate, if you do have any additional questions um, and you don't know who to reach out to, you can email those anytime to communication at litton.ca. Um, or you can email a member of the staff directly, and we're going to post in the staff contact information page there. It has everybody's names and roles and their email addresses, so please feel free to reach out to them directly. That's absolutely fine. Uh, you can also call the office. The number is 778-254-5004, and we're posting all of that information right now so that you have it there. Um, thank you all so, so much for attending today's meeting. We really appreciate all of your questions and your feedback and just for being here with us today. Um, like I said, anything that we didn't capture, we will in the written document that will be posted online. So that concludes today's community meeting. Um, thank you all so much and have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Thank mm -hmm. you.